After 30 minutes of listening to the man's charcoal scented ramblings, my notepad was sparse with information. Oven, gasoline, the egghead. The burnt man's frenzied babblings didn't give me much to go on in terms of how the fire actually started, but there wasn't any doubt over who was responsible for it. Jason Blomquist was rushed to the emergency care with third-degree burns before the blaze even in his living room had gone out. He had no prior convictions, but his father, a certain Alfred Blomquist, had spent the past two decades in a psychiatric ward up north for trying to paint his family house with gasoline. I've served in the arson department for long enough to know that the need to start fires usually singes through the family tree. Blomquist was thoroughly burnt and handcuffed to his hospital bed. His ravings didn't shed any light on the actual mechanics of the blaze, but they would serve as an easy home run for any prosecutors straight out of law school. I thanked Blomquist for his time and made my way through the sickly smelling hallways to the parking lot. Beyond the shelter of the hospital, it was storming. It was the type of downpour that could slow down, perhaps even put out a barn fire. For a couple minutes, I stood under the plastic roof and eyed the quickest route over to my car. As I made my calculations, an old man in a bathrobe and a walker made his way out of the hospital. The old guy looked frail enough to have seen the steam engine get invented, but he dragged his walker with a sort of regal authority. He shuffled his way over to the no-smoking sign, defiantly glanced at it, and produced a crumpled-up cigarillo out of his bathrobe. I took out a cigarette and joined the old-timer for some idle chit-chat. His cigarillo reeked with a horrible mix of vanilla and burnt hospital food. When he shuffled his way back inside of the hospital, I told him I'd see him around. Not likely, he rasped, just before the doors slid shut. The sprint to my car left me soaked and out of breath. Finding a steady drip of water on the case files I left on the seat didn't make me feel any better. I dug some scotch tape out of the glove box and added it to the collage of black X's on my car's roof. The rain had turned my notes into inky hieroglyphics, but the rest of the pages managed to stay intact. I had a nip, lit up another cigarette, and tried to remember what I had thought worthy of writing down. It was the sort of arson case that made an argument for a merciful god with a cruel sense of humor. Jason Blomquist, age 35, recently divorced, has a son, Kennedy Blomquist, age 6, over for the weekend. In the middle of the night, following his pop's footsteps, Jason sets a fire on the ground floor. Jason manages to get himself pretty burnt up, and the blaze consumes most of the living room by the time that the troops can contain it. But the house stays stable, and the second floor is completely untouched. The upstairs bedrooms aren't even singed. And what's more, little Kennedy is found sleeping in his bed, completely unaware of anything happening. There was an interview transcript with a kid in my morning notes. Didn't seem to be completely aware of what had happened. But when pressed on his father's behavior, he says that his pops was angry at him. The evening before the blaze. Apparently, little Kennedy had watched something on his iPad that he shouldn't have, and that set his dad off. Combined with Jason Blomquist's strange ramblings in the hospital, the case seemed pretty clear. Blomquist lost his marbles and decided to set his house on fire. Now my job was to figure out how he set his house on fire. I had another nip and thought about Blomquist's kid for a bit. Another cigarette. Did not make the rain slow down. The water started dripping back down on my passenger seat. I emptied my ashtray out of the window and rode off to the station for the mud. She was smart, if you're the sort of person who considers dogs capable of intelligence. Marilyn was a bright-eyed golden lab, one year into her five-year sentence. I've been on the force for a while. She was my fourth canine. I knew not to get too attached. These dogs were destined to solve crime till their senses dulled, and then they retire to become someone's fun rescue dinner fact. It only takes them a couple of years to forget their handler. She managed to get paw marks all over my notes when she got in the car, but the fact that they were barely legible calmed my nerves somewhat. Once Marilyn had managed to get herself comfortable, she opened her mouth and excitedly panted at the world outside. It was as if the freezing downpour beyond the windshield didn't exist for her. That mutt could retain her excitement in a meteor shower. My windshield wipers struggled on the freeway, and the inside of my car was getting unmanageably wet. Yet by the time we hit the repeating spiderweb of cul-de-sacs, the sun sheepishly peeked out from the sky. Marilyn shoved her nose through my cracked window and huffed to the outside air. 
She was better at getting me to the crime scene than my busted GPS. I don't like suburbia. There's no personality in those homeowner association dictated houses. You can see life flowing through city streets. There's character in the offbeat storefronts and the clumps of people who hang around them. People live in the city. Suburbs. It's just a place where people come to sleep and if the market isn't crashing to save up enough cash to escape somewhere tropical. The suburbs are also the place where my canines retire. When we climbed out of the car, a woman with a helmet-like haircut noticed us. She insisted on letting her snotty child pet Marilyn. When I told her that the mutt was working and shouldn't be bothered, the helmet-headed woman grew disappointingly angry and started recording me on her phone. As me and Marilyn entered the crime scene, we hear the crazy woman yelling something about civil service as her child wept in confusion. The troops were quick to contain the fire, but with suburban property prices this high, they usually are. The city's second finest had managed to contain the blaze halfway through the living room. A half-melted iPad with a screen smashed in delineated the exact extent of the fire. Everything beyond it, reaching out towards the kitchen, was charred history. The house had been cleared out early in the morning, but the hallway still seemed warm. Any hint of fresh air and manicured lawns crept away, and the air was replaced by the familiar stench of work. Marilyn stopped panting and lowered her snout. She breathed in that symphony of smells her ancestors were bred for, took a couple more sniffs for safety, and then sat down. She looked up at me like a hungry red-light window model. Marilyn was loose for treats. They all are. If you're holding something to eat, you're a dog's best friend. If your hands are empty, you're about as interesting as the next person who walks by holding a burger. Affection doesn't come for free, and neither does arson investigation. I reached into the treat bag and pulled out a grease-smelling cookie shaped like a cartoon bone. She ate her reward in one bite and immediately proceeded to work for another one. Marilyn huffed in the fumes from the black floor and dragged me down the burnt-down hallway. By the time we were in the kitchen, I didn't need an arson dog to show me where the fire started. I smelled it myself. I said, could have solved this one on my own, but I still gave her a treat. The kitchen had the obvious wear and tear of a house fire, but the oven seemed to have come out of a wholly different disaster. The metal was bent and jagged, clearly pointing towards an explosion. Blomquist had shoved something covered in accelerant into the oven and decided to cook it. Case solved. I asked, anything else of note, Marilyn? She studied my face for a moment as if I was speaking an alien language. Then her big brown eyes jumped down to the treat bag. She stared at the food like a jonesing drunk and then sniffed at the air. With a tug on the leash, she let me know that her nose might pick up another trail, granted that I had the grub to back it up. Marilyn led me to the garage. Even before the fire, Blomquist's car must have driven circles around his property value. The ride was new and screamed midlife crisis. Off in the corner sat a bunch of workout equipment still in its box. Marilyn sniffed it without much enthusiasm. She wasn't interested in how Jason Blomquist was dealing with his divorce. She was interested in the dusty shelf on the far side of the garage. Most of the space was taken up by unused tools and electronics that were too useless to keep, but too expensive to throw away. Yet among the forgotten items, there was something bright and baby blue. A bowl. I pointed at the bowl. You want me to look at that? Marilyn's jowls grew wet. I fed her a treat that was shaped like a hydrant. The bowl was covered with what seemed to be old tablecloth. For a second, I thought that the mud had showed me to Blomquist's experiment with self-rising dough, but the moment I removed the covering, I knew she found another lead. The bowl smelled like a gas station in the sticks. Inside the bowl sat an egg-shaped mess of ground beef and flour. The egghead, I thought. I disregarded most of Blomquist's hospital bed ravings as actual insanity, or at least a precursor to an insanity plea. In between the sips of water that the nurse administered Blomquist kept on rasping about having to create the egghead and doing it all for science. It all seemed like gibberish at the time, but looking down at the egg-shaped sculpture, I wish I had recorded the interview. The craftsmanship of the egg was bizarre. The body was rough and covered in loose chunks and strands of meat. The eyes of the figure were nothing but deep thumb indentations, yet the stubby limbs of the egghead looked as if they were made out of marble. Every finger existed in its own 
grayish, reddish right. The bottom of the shoes were flat enough to stand on. As I examined the hunk of gasoline-soaked meat, I noticed that the teeth of the egghead were also threateningly detailed. I had a nip, and then I draped the cloth back over the baby blue bowl. The smell of accelerants were making my head throb, so I cracked open the back door and let in some air. Beyond the door, there was a fence, and beyond that fence, there was a gravel path towards a nature trail. A gentle drizzle returned, but it was muffled under the bubbling of a nearby stream. The fresh air had cleared my head. My lungs weren't satisfied with inhaling the smell of fresh-cut grass. I knocked a cigarette out of the pack and almost put it in my mouth before I realized where I was. I forced the smoke back into its box and elected to take the plastic bowl back to the station. While I managed to control my urges, however, the mutt did not. The wheeze escaped my lips before I had a chance to properly grip the leash. Shit! By the time my lips pursed for the sh... Marilyn was sprinting through the backyard. She jumped the fence with the ease of a track horse and slammed her front paws on a tree. Up in the branches, where its fur slick with rain, sat a hyperventilating squirrel. Marilyn's sole purpose for existing boiled down to terrifying the tiny creature. I called. I wiggled the bag of treats. I called again. Nothing helped. The only thing that these mutts like more than food is chasing vermin. I walked out of the garage, lit up a cigarette, and made my way across the fence in as dignified a manner as I could. By the time I got to the tree, Marilyn's hunter instincts had evaporated and all that was left was shame. She kept her head low and stared up at me with a guilt that revealed the whites of her eyes. It's all right. We all have demons to fight, I said, then grabbed the leash. I wanted to get out of the rain and back to the station. Whatever I had witnessed in the garage would be easier to process after a cup of coffee. I tugged, but she didn't move. Marilyn was too busy sniffing the air. I tried puffing on my soaked cigarette, but came up smokeless. I stubbed out the cigarette on the gravel and pulled on the leash again. Come on, Marilyn. Let's get you back in the station. Marilyn didn't want to go to the station. She kept her nose to the gravel. Then she pulled. I took out a treat to see whether she was serious, but Marilyn didn't even eye the bag. She pulled again. She was on the trail. She led me towards the bubbling of a stream and an old wooden bridge. Walking through the nature trail, I found myself worrying that Marilyn had simply caught the scent of maybe another squirrel. But the moment I saw the bridge, I knew she had something. Pressed into the aging wood, there were footsteps. Burnt black into the bridge as if made by a small, perfectly spherical shoe there were footsteps. The egghead, I thought. My hands reflectively brushed up against my holster. I didn't know what to point the gun at, I just wanted to make sure that it was there. I felt way in over my head. Past the bridge, the waddling footsteps disappeared into the muddy path. When the black tracks disappeared, Marilyn slowed down, but she still had a direction. As we stomped through the mud, her pull lessened. Whatever tracks she had been following had grown faint. Marilyn was still after something, but, but her steps lost their confidence. Not knowing what to make of the situation, I let the mud drag me around while I figured out what to do. The wind had picked up and brought the rain down in gentle waves. I let the droplets wash over my tired face and tried to clear my mind by listening to the stream. At first, my thoughts kept on drifting to that chunk of sculpted meat soaked in gasoline. But with some calm breaths and a quick nip, I managed to get my head screwed on straight. I listened to the bubbling stream and Marilyn sniffing, and the falling rain and their far-off traffic. The strange hissing sound. Like someone throwing water on a hot stove. It came from beneath the old bridge. By the time I was certain of the strange sound, Marilyn had completely lost the trail. I gave her another bone-shaped cookie for a good effort and then beckoned her towards the bridge. She sniffed in the air again, caught something beyond my comprehension, and took the lead herself. With each gust of rain, the hissing sound grew louder. As Marilyn dragged me off the dirt path, I started to hear something else. Beneath the strange hiss, a voice lingered and babbled in a gentle falsetto. Marilyn growled. She saw him before I did. 
but my eyes finally came across the egg-shaped creature, I mumbled a prayer. I drew my gun. His body was of grayish flesh, not unlike the egghead I found in the garage. Each droplet that hit the creature's meaty body, however, turned to steam. Wherever the rain hit the flesh simmered up with foamy white and left a mark. The creature sat beneath the bridge, but the wind was strong enough to curve the droplets. The creature didn't seem to mind. He just babbled to himself with his sharp little teeth. He just babbled to himself and watched me. Unlike the work in progress I found in the garage, this egghead had eyes. Big red-hot coals rested in the creature's sockets. The egghead's gaze sizzled as it noticed me. He stopped babbling and he got up and he waddled his way towards me. I dropped the leash and I grabbed the gun proper and yelled at the egg to stop moving. He didn't listen. Instead, the creature raised his stubby arms towards me. He smelled like sulfur. He smelled like, like sulfur and those short, fat fingers were stretching out towards me like marble worms slathered in grease. The egghead's fingers slid towards me. One bark from my pistol made him retreat. I blew a hole right down his forehead and he fell over. An overpowering stench of rotten eggs took control of the air. The thing was oozing a yolky greenish fluid out of its wounds. One of the egghead's fiery eyes, being dislodged by my bullet, lay a stone's throw away from the corpse. When the viscous green liquid reached the hot coal that coagulated into what looked like scrambled eggs. No, Marilyn, there's nothing good here for you. I barely got a hold of the leash to keep her from investigating. She refused any verbal orders to sit. It wasn't until I threw her a treat that I got her attention. Needing some space, I slipped the leash off and threw a handful of biscuits into the grass. Marilyn quickly occupied herself hunting. My hands were shaking. I instinctively reached into my jacket for a nip, but I realized the possible problems of having alcohol to my breath while trying to explain this Eggman. I lit up a cigarette and I picked up my phone instead. Calling the station seemed like the most reasonable thing to do. Somebody else needed to see what I was seeing. As the phone rang, I started to worry whether I wasn't getting myself sent to an asylum for telling the chief what I saw. But then a wholly different concern occupied my thoughts. A babbling. The egghead was babbling again. Before I even reached for my gun, the terrifying thing was back on its feet. Before I even managed to aim, it had me down in the mud. The egghead didn't waddle this time, instead launching itself with shocking force straight into my solar plexus. The creature was the size of a football, but it packed the punch of an artillery fire. I felt my ribs crack. My breath left my lungs like a stampede at a theater fire. The egghead straddled my chest with such weight that my panicking heart strained. The creature's right eye socket had been reduced to a circle of what looked like burnt meat and pus, but its left eye, its left eye burnt with fiery rage. The babbling had gotten louder and sterner as if the small egghead was to teach me a lesson. His stubby fingers turned long once more. With a strange gentleness, they slithered down to my collarbone. I couldn't breathe and the egghead was tickling me. At first, the eggshell-covered fingers simply grazed against my neck, but soon, soon enough, the strange sensation turned painful. The thin fingers were growing increasingly hot. I could smell my stubble being singed. With my lungs compressed and hot irons at my vocal cords, I couldn't manage anything but a yelp. A yelp, luckily, was all that the girl needed. With a growl I'd never heard before, Marilyn knocked the egghead off my chest. She barked at the fumbling creature with the intensity of a shotgun and then leapt at it once more. Marilyn's second contact with the creature, however, was met with a sharp whimper. She sunk her teeth into the creature but immediately let go. A puff of smoke came out of the dog's mouth and the oval creature went crashing into the stream. The egghead met the water with a sputtering of a sauna rock. The water was starting to turn muddy with the rain. But I could see the creature clearly. Its flesh had turned the pale white of an eggshell, and the coal eye sprung bubbles like a hangover tablet. But the thing was still alive. I stomped at the monster. I stomped at the egghead until all that was left was coagulating clumps of greenish goo flowing down the stream. I made sure the egghead had been taken care of. 
and then I climbed out of the water to check up on the dog. She wasn't doing well. I didn't leave anything out of the report. The manila envelope I dropped at the chief's desk had the look of an overzealous sandwich. I described the egghead in detail. I included sketches and theories and even some photographs of what remained of the terror before the spring carried it away. Didn't do any help. The rest of the station was reluctant to believe what I had to say, but I had given some leeway to focus on the Blomquist fire investigation. A second interview with the burnt man didn't reveal anything new. All Jason Blomquist did was nonsensical blabber about the egghead again and speak about the importance of science. After a train ride up north, I managed to flag down Blomquist's ex-wife for a cup of coffee, but the conversation was fruitless as well. Aside from the couple mentions of his father's internment, Jason Blomquist never spoke about arson, let alone showed any signs or any tendencies towards it. I wanted to sit down with the kid, Kenny, shed any light on the fire, but his mother refused to let me interview him. I could have nudged someone at the station to make the interview mandatory, but I didn't. Forcing the kid to talk to me wouldn't make the nightmares of the egg-shaped creature disappear. Wouldn't bring Marilyn's sense of smell back. For a while, I fought the idea. But eventually, I let all the thoughts of the Eggman die in the muddy stream of the cracked shell. Now, she had burned her gums, and would have to be careful about solid foods for the rest of her life. But it was her nose that had really been given the death sentence. Marilyn's sense of smell would never... Never come back. The creature that the mud had rendered herself. The vet had figured it out within a couple of minutes of the visit. In an effort to save me from the insane creature, the mutt had rendered herself unemployable. I couldn't adopt her. Arson dogs don't belong in cramped city apartments. But what I did manage to do, however, was pull some strings and shoot down some adoption requests. After calling in a couple of favors with the pen pushers, Marilyn managed to get adopted by my nephew out east. I have to drive half the country to get to her. But after the winter holidays, once all the fireworks have been set off, it's, it's too cold for the forest fires. I, I see her. I see her, and, and she remembers me. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Kitty Pasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching today's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you're listening on the podcast, then hey, thank you for subscribing to the podcast. If you're not watching on the podcast or watching on YouTube, I'd appreciate if you if you subscribe to the YouTube because both are both 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 are very good. They're important to me. And as always, I want to give a huge thank you out to everybody who's out there on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, and to everybody who's already a part of it and even giving just one dollar. Thank you guys so much for making it possible for me to be able to continue to do this and even be able to get some exclusive stories that we only have here on the channel and you can't find anywhere else. So a big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Reaper61167, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, Adam Morris, Grand Moth the Milky, Big Smoke369, Michael McIver, Captain Scurvy, Salty Irish Poet, Esteban, Braden Morris, Nate Cole, Horror Fan1212, Our Insect Time, Kyle Resnack, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Robert Malcolm, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochie Boochies, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Merxinum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Cato Baker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob the Sh Rob like sharp thing. Chaos Arts. Cryolinian. Xavier Graphius. Lord Life's Best. Goreng Trimagasi. Maria Walker. Emily Mitchell. Crazy Kid. Mr. Marcus Blitz. Ike Limchok. Dirt Diver 030. Matt Bach. Voice of Sand. Coffee Zombie. Hidden Tiger. Shelly J. Jeremy H. Psychomel. Nana. Deleted Account. Melted Lake. Tully Sue. William King. David Miver. Michael Ortiz. Satanic Aries. Bardo Hawks 764. Lambda M98. Harley. Sashi Suzaku. Cronut 509. Kaylee Ambrose. Suji Campbell. Stricken. Azarine Fox. Freddy Krueger. Happy Birthday Jason Wilson. Lisa Cottrell. Caspian. Hades Nephew. Tater Chip. Acid System. Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society. Benjamin Welvert. Here with this law. Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. My goodness, the list is getting long. <gasps> but hey, I appreciate all of you. And everybody down in the description, and everybody who's a part of the Patreon, period. 
Thank you guys so much for making this happen, for getting treats for Hercules and Hylas and helping me keep the lights on around here. And to everybody who watches and subs and likes and leaves comments and does all those things, sweet dreams. <laughs>